Hello and um, welcome to our current event stream. I'm Akash. And I'm Fatma. And today we're going to talk a lot about COVID-19 and its impact here in the United States, around the globe, and a little bit about um, the upcoming election in 2020. So as always, remember to follow Fiveable on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Today, like I mentioned before, we're going to talk more about coronavirus, um, some domestic current events, international current events, some happy news um, that hopefully don't really have to do anything with coronavirus since that's all we hear about. Um, and then Fatima will do uh, more of a 2020 election update in terms of um, the politics world. So let's get started. Um, the United States now has the most confirmed cases worldwide in terms of the COVID-19. Um, we have 140,900 or so cases and 2,400 deaths. Um, in terms of those deaths, um, 900 of those are travel related. So um, either from China, Italy, Iran, all of those countries that were severely impacted before um, it really became a crisis in the United States. Um, additionally, uh, the nationwide social distancing guidelines. So um, if you've been paying attention to any of the really any news or any media at all, um, the thing that's kind of been floated around for the past few days is President Trump's um, 15 day measures to flatten the curve um, to stop coronavirus. Um, that Those guidelines have been extended for 30 more days. Um, President Trump wanted to relax these by Easter, saying that it was like a really happy time for Americans. However, after talking to Anthony, or I believe his name's Anthony Fauci, um, he hopes that the social distancing guidelines following those um, again within the next month will mitigate the possible cases and deaths that could result um, from coronavirus. Um, Fauci, he's kind of been um, hailed as like a um, really a key figure in this administration and within the government in terms of the coronavirus. He's the director of um, the National Institute of, Institute of Allergy, Allergy and Infectious Diseases. So um, huge title, but really he's been a um, like key medical expert within the Trump administration and he's been helping convey um, a scientific perspective on this disease to the public. Um, he's a part of Mike Pence's coronavirus task force, and um, they've really kind of collaborated with him as well as a few other doctors, um, the Surgeon General, all of those people on the team, they're all trying to, um, again, have that common goal of mitigating this crisis within the next few weeks. So on the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit more. Um, we've talked now about the executive branch and what they've done. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the legislative branch and the stuff that they've passed recently. So this is like a um, huge deal um, that's happened. Stephen Mnuchin, um, the Secretary of Treasury, um, addressed the $2 trillion stimulus bill that was passed by Congress. And he stated that it would be direct deposited to Americans within the next three weeks. However, many believe that it will take longer. Um, there were um, probably smaller scale things that happened like this in 2006 and I believe also in 2008. Um, and based on what happened with those, um, many believe that it will take longer. Um, this is going to be a direct payment to many Americans and it also includes an expansion in unemployment benefits. Um, it also includes a third kind of clause in this is that it provides $350 billion in terms of small business loans. So it's kind of a three-part scenario um, in terms of a direct payment, so um, like literally a direct deposit into your bank account, um, unemployment benefits, and um, in helping like the business world, um, that like billions of dollars in small business loans. Um, in terms of how this all breaks down, in terms of the money that you will receive, um, I inserted like a slide that I saw from Fox News, and I mean, it's any news network; they're all kind of broadcasting the same stuff. Um, it's $1,200 per adult. And then if you're, obviously if it's a couple, it's 2,400 and then dependents like a child, um, that would be $500. Um, these payments phase out if you have an income of over $775,000 for individuals. And then that's doubled for, um, couples and Brandon just posted in the chat. There's several news networks and I can see, including the Washington post have like done like a calculation thing where you can enter your data and it'll tell you how much you will be expected to receive. Um, like I said earlier, there's a reduction in terms of how much you'll get if you're making over $75,000 for an individual and there's no payout if you're making um, over $99,000 um, as an individual. And you, these incomes that they're classifying is based on um, your tax returns from 2019 and 2018. So if your income has changed 
in 2020, this like um, this stimulus package isn't going to address that right now. However, next year um, there is going to be something in terms of tax returns that will benefit you if um, your income has drastically reduced between the last time you filed your um, tax returns and now. So um, I'd really recommend checking this out, especially if you are um, perhaps a college student, you don't know if you're classified as independent um, under your family. It's a good thing to check out just so that you can stay informed. Um, okay, there's a question, where can you find a list of essential non-essential jobs? You know, do you know how they classify those? So that varies state by state, even county by county. Um, I know like in my state, they published like a whole list probably yesterday and it was like through Twitter. Like probably if you look at your governor's Twitter page, you will be able to find everything about non-essential and essential jobs. They've kind of been posting all these things um, as they come out and then people will ask, well, what about this? And then they kind of address that. So if you are looking in terms of a particular profession or a particular business that might be open, I would just recommend looking that up and attaching your state name to your search um, so that you know the most specific information for your region. Um, we will talk about in this stream um, kind of a unique case in Kansas where like churches and like gun shops are considered essential in this time of like crisis. So um, kind of back to this, I hope that answers your question. But um, what does the um, World Health Organization say about masks, right? So even when I go out like in my neighborhood, like walking, riding my bike, anything, I see people wearing their masks or wearing masks, right? Whether they're in their car, driving somewhere, or just like I've even seen like little kids, like five-year-old, six-year-olds wearing these masks. So um, the World Health Organization kind of in response to this, I mean, this has kind of been floating around on social media for a long time. They put out a statement that said, um, basically that people should not be wearing face masks unless they're sick or caring for someone who is sick or is in consistent contact with someone that's sick because there's no evidence to suggest that this is effective in terms of like preventing the illness. Um, additionally, right now, again, if you've been listening to the news, there's a huge shortage across the world of masks and medical supplies. You might hear the term PPE that um, means personal protective um, gear or equipment. Um, there's like a huge shortage and the medical professionals that are on the front lines of this crisis, often they don't have the materials that are um, necessary to protect themselves. There have been cases in like New York where these healthcare professionals have been told you have to use this one mask and you have to keep it for a week. Like you have to make it last for a week and they're treating patients with coronavirus. So um, because of all of that, the WHO really recommends that you not use these um, masks on a consistent basis, especially if you have no contact um, with a person that has it. Obviously, if you have it or if a person you know has it that you come into contact with, wear a mask. Like we're not saying don't wear a mask, but the WHO is saying that um, if you are not a part of that group, don't wear a mask because a lot of those things can be donated um, to people that are in need that are working on those front lines. So on the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, some research that was published um, and some facts and figures. So um, right now, these are just like a random collection of facts, honestly, that I um, kind of came across as I was researching for this presentation. And they didn't really quite fit in anywhere else, but I thought um, these were all pretty interesting. So on the right, you can see a map that was updated this morning and the cases have actually, again, gone up. Um, it's kind of still increasing exponentially. That's why they kind of talk about flattening the curve. Um, so just today, 500 COVID-19 deaths were reported in the United States. Um, basically what flattening the curve means is that you're trying to lessen the strain on the healthcare system. So if the same amount of people get infected, but over a longer period of time, um, that decreases the stress that the healthcare system is facing and all of these beds that are available for people that are sick, you know, those can be more available to the people that actually need it. So um, in response to this, recommendations from our own Department of Health and Human Services, um, as well as various state governments, um, kind of looking at what's happened across the world. 70% of the US population is now under stay at home or shelter in place order, something of that sort. Um, additionally, President Trump did say that the United States has received supplies from other countries um, such as Russia and China. So this was kind of um, a little bit interesting for people who were um, you know, kind of doubting the relationship right now between um, Russia, China, and the United States, kind of, I don't know, an interesting twist. Um, additionally, he said that a nationwide stay at home order is unlikely at this time. However, um, various other like doctors and physicians that work with him in the federal government kind of have said that um, 
nothing can be ruled out at this point because again, we're um, trying to fight this crisis and um, flatten the curve. So it's kind of, everything is up in the air. Um, just like you guys, I mean, we learn on every, like every day there's something new about this and that's all that's on the news. And, you know, it's just kind of our job to um, stay up to date. Additionally, this was something interesting that really only came out within the past few hours. Um, the FDA has authorized a 15 minute COVID-19 test that basically gives you an answer in terms of, do you have coronavirus or do you not within 15 minutes? So um, it's kind of the same technology that's used as rapid flu testing, where like you go to the doctor, and if they think you have the flu, then they would test you. And then really quickly before you leave the doctor's office, you would know if you had the flu. So that's kind of um, the reason why the FDA is trying to get this out into the mainstream as quick as possible, just because like, I don't know if you've seen like on social media, like there's like line, like huge lines of like cars get waiting to get tested. Um, so like I live near the Charlotte Motor Speedway. Um, and I think they're doing like offering free tests there. So like there's a huge backup. Like I've seen pictures of people that are waiting to get tested for this disease. Um, additionally, in terms of the death rate, the Lancet Infectious Diseases, um, their like institute, they published um, a death rate of around 0.6%. So this was kind of, um, a lot different from what was published before because this um, kind of count or percentage takes into account the um, mild and undiagnosed cases. So people that probably didn't report them because either they didn't know about it, um, things like that. So that's what this 0.66% is from. However, if you don't take into account those mild or undiagnosed cases, um, the death or death percentage is around 1.38%, which is more consistent with um, what has already been reported. Now, this is still far higher than the flu, which has a death rate of about 0.1%. So it is still something that um, you should not necessarily worry about, but kind of pay attention to as it develops. All right, so now on the next slide, we're gonna talk a little bit more about COVID-19's implications in terms of government. Um, so like I said before, um, Someone asked a question about essential and non-essential services. This is an example in a particular state, Kansas, who has made um, or which has made guns and church services um, essential functions. Okay, so this kind of ties back into AP government and the curriculum. So they signed an or the governor signed an executive order and basically said essential functions will not be disrupted. Now, you know, everyone agreed with that. However, when you kind of go back into it, it says that church and gun stores are included in this. So this kind of um, you know, raise some eyebrows because it was interesting. Um, this reflects a political environment for a Democratic governor in a very conservative state. So if you know anything about Kansas or you might live in Kansas or have seen election results, it is a very conservative state, predominantly Republican. President Trump beat um, Hillary Clinton here by 20 percentage points. And I'm sorry, I used it wrong here. Um, so to all my English language folks, my apologies. Um, however, this shows that even in terms of a state government, um, these governors have to pay attention to the political climate that their um, state is in. So this governor wants to get reelected at some point. So she knows that she has to appease the Republican electorate. So um, various states have various policies and often these policies are influenced by uh, upcoming elections, like politics that are happening in that state, like at that moment. Um, so it's kind of important to pay attention to this stuff. like. Interestingly, Kansas, I think, was the first state to announce that um, all schools are going to be closed through the end of their academic year, um, because obviously, I mean, that's to be expected and kind of happening across the country now. However, this executive order still allows these gun stores and church services to be open. So just kind of interesting to examine how these different states' policies and the way in which they handle this crisis is different based on um, the electorate and that relationship between the electorate and the people that are making those decisions at the state level. So on the next slide, I believe we're gonna talk about the Olympics. Yes, Olympics. So the Tokyo Olympics have been confirmed for 2021. So obviously Olympics happen like, you know, in the even years like 2016, 2020 election years. Um, however, because of this um, pandemic that is spreading, Across the world and even though I did see that Japan really doesn't have as many cases as um, other countries in that area um, people would have to travel like tons of people would travel to that country to witness the Olympics and therefore it was really the best interest of everyone to postpone the Olympics this is the first time that the Olympics have been postponed rather than canceled 
Um, and it's also the first time that like it's kind of been altered due to or in like peacetime. So in 1916, the Olympics were canceled during World War One, and then 1940 and 1944, those Olympics were canceled due to World War Two. Right now, there's no physical war happening or well, world war happening. However, they are being postponed. So the new start dates were announced. Um, it's July 23rd, 2021 for the Olympics, and then August 24th, 2021 for the Paralympics. So kind of interesting, I was looking at like um, the Olympics and like all those updates and I saw all these new sports that are being introduced. So three by three or three on three basketball, freestyle BMX, karate, um, sport climbing, surfing, skateboarding, all of these are being introduced at the 2020 Olympics. Also baseball and softball, I thought these were a part of the Olympics. So I guess I was mistaken, but they're returning for the first time since 2008. So the I guess the past two Olympics, 2012 and 2016 did not feature them. However, they will be returning for the 2020, 2021 Olympics. Um, now, in terms of the economic kind of thing or economic effects that this causes, um, this was supposed to be a major boost to Japan's economy. If you think about the Olympics, um, think about how much revenue that brings into the city and the country as a whole, like in terms of tourism, hotels, restaurants, all of these businesses that now are shut down because of the coronavirus. And um, this kind of increases the economic stress on Japan and because now they kind of had to wait another year for this to hopefully happen. Um, in terms of like the economic benefits and how eager these countries are to have um, the Olympics happen there, like someone like in London politics, so in Britain, they were like, oh, if it doesn't happen in Tokyo, we can bring it to London like you know bring it over here as soon as you can because you know we already have all the infrastructure built from 2012 it would be so easy and japan like their politicians went crazy they were like this is so inappropriate we want it here for next year and you guys are already saying you want it so this like creates fights like olympics are a big deal in our world like because of not only like it's fun and like the people get to enjoy it but the economic um impact on the country is huge okay so on the next slide i think we're going to talk or end this kind of segment, uh, never mind. Not happy news yet. We will get to happy news. However, um, this is it about DACA. So DACA, if you don't know what that is, it's the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. Um, basically, it's for undocumented immigrants that were brought to the country when they were young. So it helps them um, stay in the United States legally during that time. Um, President Trump has kind of, uh, or well, has really indicated that he's opposed to it, um, and. Kind of this has to again go back to coronavirus so undocumented immigrants a lot of them are working as healthcare providers and healthcare workers there's almost twenty seven thousand of them so this not only includes like everyone from like college students who are um they're about to enter the health field this also includes um people that are doctors and these people often or some of them are in um, classified as DACA recipients now these twenty seven thousand health workers or people on behalf of them have sent a letter to the supreme court kind of urging them not to take action right now because really that could be worse for um, our country, even in terms of health. Um, additionally, these oral arguments um, were heard in the fall already in terms of the Trump administration's attempt to stop the program. A decision was expected in June, but now with everything that's happening that you know, we're not sure, um, kind of everything that surrounds politics is floating in uncertainty because of this epidemic, pandemic, I believe. Okay, so I think now we're actually gonna do happy news. Yes, okay, yay. Um, kind of let's forget about, you know, helps us forget a little bit about everything negative that's happening in the world and you can enjoy like the two pictures of the puppy. Um, so one thing that I wanna point out that I've seen like on Twitter a lot is um, all these old people that are recovering from coronavirus. So you hear so much about, you know, it's so dangerous to the elderly and seniors, which it is. However, it's nice when you hear like all these people that are recovering. So like a 101 year old um, in Italy recovered from the coronavirus. Um, she was born during the Spanish flu and now she's recovered from this. So it's like a huge life story. Um, additionally, there was a couple, I believe it was in Washington state that was separated on their anniversary. That doesn't mean they can't celebrate. So um, I think the wife was in the nursing home and um, the guy, like he couldn't visit her in the nursing home because they're closing um, those homes to all outside visitors. So the guy, he made a little sign for her and it says like, um, I still love you after 67 years. And that was cute. And then pet adoption is actually up amid this crisis. So a lot of people were expecting that, you know, these pets would be given back to um, these shelters because 
Um, you know, people are losing money and they might not be able to afford these pets. However, pet adoption is actually rising um, during this time. So that was really interesting. And finally, um, it's Madagascar's 60th birthday. So I think it was within the past week. And Madagascar is our most biodiverse nation. And in order to celebrate their 60th birthday, they did something impressive. They held um, their largest ever tree planting ceremony. And literally 1 million seedlings went into the ground within um, a, I believe, like within a few hours of all the speeches being made on Independence Day. No, not the movie, the real country, but yeah. So happy news. That's it for happy news. So now Fatima is going to talk a little bit more about election 2020. Uh, so obviously COVID-19 has been having a like huge impact on like not only the healthcare system, but it's also been sparking like movements to make sure that workers are more well protected, right? Because earlier in the stream, we talked about like who is considered to be like an essential or a non-essential worker. Well, specifically at Amazon, um, they haven't been like closing down their facilities. So workers at Amazon's uh, Staten Island Fulfillment Center, they walked out today um, to protest like how Amazon had not been responding to COVID-19 infections among its employees, right? And so pretty much what these workers were saying is that they weren't taking the precautions that needed to be taken in order to keep workers safe. And so that was things like notifying um, workers if someone who they had been working with had gotten a COVID-19 uh, like infection and had like tested positive for it. And so that's something that Amazon like had hadn't or in some cases like in uh, delayed doing. And so obviously, if you've come into contact with someone who's tested positive for COVID-19, right, you would want to like self quarantine, make sure that infection doesn't like keep spreading so we can like hashtag flatten the curve. And so by like delaying notifying these workers that like an infection had occurred, um, the, they were saying that they were be they were being put at a higher risk. And so um, these workers who walked out, they're calling for Amazon to shut down that facility for two weeks so they can like completely like deep clean it. That means like sanitize all the surfaces, like wipe everything down, make sure that like they can like protect workers when they like go back, right? And so until like now, um, Amazon has only closed their facilities if they were forced to do so by the government. Um, like by a governor's order or like a county order or if workers had protested. And so like they actually couldn't keep functioning. And so that's like a really important thing to consider, right? Because when we're thinking about workers' rights, especially like when we think about unionization over like the course of American history, like it's these kinds of like walkouts and protests that like make sure that like workers stay protected in the long term. And so like that's what workers at Amazon and companies like Instacart are trying to like make sure that like they get. So like at Instacart, there's like more than a like 150,000 workers that are like planning to go on like a national strike. And so because they're like uh, Instacart's like this online grocery delivery service. And so you can like shop for your groceries and then they'll deliver them. So it's kind of like Uber Eats for groceries. So because they're like kind of like on the front lines when it comes to like being out and about in public, these workers are calling for like higher pay and um, like increased protections, like same thing that like Amazon workers want, which is like completely reasonable because if you're like, your life is being put at risk um, potentially for like, and like potentially catching like COVID-19 infection, you would want to make sure that like you have benefits to go with that or at the very least you're being like protected by your company to make sure that you don't get the infection in the first place right so that's what these um workers are trying to make sure that they have and so it's exactly why they've been like walking out and protesting and so um it's likely that we'll see stuff like this like only increase because instacart and amazon are only like two of like the biggest companies where this is happening but it's also happening in like smaller companies um, with like less workers. And so it's, uh, COVID-19 is also having like a pretty big impact on the democratic primary because right now, um, we're down from like 700 people running in the democratic primary to two. Um, and so right now it's just Senator Sanders and former VP, uh, Joe Biden, who are like still battling it out for like the nomination. 
And so even though VP Biden like has um, like a lead in delegates, uh, they've both been like impacted. Um, both have had to like cancel rallies and like go completely digital. And so like when you think about that, um, this has sort of been like an advantage for like the Sanders campaign because he's like, uh, his campaign has like way more infrastructure when it comes to like digitally reaching out to voters. And so like pretty much like a lot of days of the week, Senator Sanders has had like, um, like fireside chats uh, where he's like interviewed uh, people and had like panels of like healthcare workers come and talk about like important steps that people should be taking in order to like stay safe. And he's also like used this, this platform where like millions of people are tuning in to like um, advocate for uh, his policies like universal health care and worker protections. So even though a lot of states have been like postponing their primary contests in order to like make sure that people are following social distancing guidelines and that they're like not huge crowds of people where infection could like spread quickly. Um, we're seeing that June 2nd, because of that reason, um, it's shaping up to be like a mini Super Tuesday. Like now there's almost 700 delegates that are like going to be like up for grabs by like only two candidates, right? And so like the reason why they've been like rescheduled is because one, they don't want people to like be in huge crowds and potentially like catch the infection, but also because like uh, they'll have to like set up in these states will have to like set up infrastructure if they don't already have a lot of infrastructure for mail-in ballots. Um, so that's what like Ohio had to do with like in a span of like a couple of weeks. And so like a situation like this um, is exactly why Senator Sanders message of universal health care is becoming like more appealing to a lot of people, right? Um, and so it's like a lot of articles have been put out where healthcare um, workers have had to like charge people like thousands of dollars, like tens of thousands of dollars for like basic necessities, like COVID-19 testing. And so like, that's a huge burden on someone, especially like in a pandemic, you wanna make sure that like everyone is being tested and treated regardless of whether or not like they have healthcare. And so um, even though like, that is true. Uh, Joe Biden still recently said that he opposes like Medicare for all. Um, and so that's like a huge point of like contention and disagreement between those two candidates. Um, so yeah, uh, but in order to make sure that these states have like more infrastructure and people are actually able to vote when like June 2nd or their primary contest comes up, um, 15 states have like delayed their Democratic primaries. And so uh, Tom Perez, who is the Democratic National Committee chairman, had said that states need to focus on expanding absentee voting and voting by mail um, because of like moving around these primaries, because like there would be no way for people to actually like predict the virus. And so they couldn't just like keep postponing it and keep postponing it and keep postponing it. So he said like, it's time to like set up infrastructure for people to be able to like vote remotely, um, in this case, like mail in their ballots rather than like keep pushing the election back because like there's no way for like health, even health officials to predict exactly when the pandemic is gonna like come to an end and when it's gonna be like completely safe for everyone to like go vote and wait in line to like cast their ballot. But this has actually had like a like unexpected benefit because even though Illinois, um, which relies mostly on like in-person voting where you like have to physically go to the polls, um, it saw a 25% decrease in turnout. But Florida and Arizona, two st states that have like a very robust infrastructure for early voting and voting by mail, um, in both those states, they saw an increase in overall turnout. So like, obviously, like making sure that everyone can vote regardless of uh, what, like where they are is super important. So like these states are having to expand their access for voting by mail and absentee voting. So it's sort of like an unexpected benefit that is coming in the middle of like this huge crisis. But hopefully they're like 
policies for no excuse absentee voting, which pretty much just means that like if you want to like vote absentee, you really don't need like a reason to do it because in like some states you have to be like, oh, I'll be overseas or this reason or that reason. Um, no excuse absentee voting means that like you can just request the ballot and they'll send it to you without asking questions. Um, maybe that'll like keep going after the pandemic. So because they already have like the resources to do it. Right. And so that's how states are handling um, mail-in voting. And so this last topic is doesn't directly have to do with like elections, but it's still something that is super important when it comes to healthcare. So in Texas, the attorney general, whose name is Ken Paxton, said that Governor Greg Abbott's executive order, which said that all non-necessary medical procedures were banned, um, should also include abortions. So even though Greg Abbott didn't specifically include them, the attorney general for the state, uh, whose name is like Ken Paxton, like I said two seconds ago, said that they should be. And so um, state officials were saying that it was necessary to do this in order to like preserve medical resources during the pandemic, right? But because Texas isn't having like a huge um, number of cases of COVID-19, like it's not like New York, we're not like super dense in Texas, like densely populated. Um, it was largely seen as an ideological move. So that's part of the reason why a federal judge temporarily blocked Texas's ban on abortions. So that's going to last until April 13th. And so um, the U.S. District Judge Lee Yeckel said that um, people seeking abortion would suffer serious and irreparable harm if that ban were allowed to continue. So it's super interesting, like if you think about it, like Texas has not had a great couple of weeks when it comes to like state officials talking about COVID-19, like, uh, like Ken Patrick, no, Dan Patrick, our like um, lieutenant governor said that like old people would willingly die to save the economy, which was like a really like, n like, no, we want to save lives, not like let people like die just because they're like elderly. Um, so it's like in a pandemic, especially when you're like a state official, like actions like these will very likely impact their reelection chan chances, or at least you would want them to, right? Because if you're a state official and you're in charge of responding to a pandemic, you wanna make sure that the people in charge of saving other people's lives are actually like acting in everyone's best interest instead of like taking these like ideologically motivated actions that are in the long term only going to hurt people. So that's a thought. But on that note, that's all me and Oculish have for you today. 